the gradient of that with respect to W, it's just 2 WD times W. Right? And so remember, this is our constant, which in our case was like, well, in that little loop, it was 1 E neg 5. Okay? And that's our weights. And like, we could replace WD with like 2 WD without loss of generality, so let's throw away the 2. So in other words, all weight decay does is it subtracts some constant times the weights every time we do a batch. So that's why it's called weight decay, right? When it's in this form where we add the square to the loss function, that's called L2 regularization. When it's in this form where we subtract WD times weights from the gradients, that's called weight decay. And they are kind of mathematically identical. For everything we've seen so far, in fact, they are mathematically identical. Right? And we'll see in a moment a place where they're not, where things get interesting. Okay, so this is just a really important tool you now have in your toolbox. You can make giant neural networks, right, and still avoid overfitting by adding more weight decay, okay? Or you could use really small data sets with moderately large sized models and avoid overfitting with weight decay. It's not magic, right? Like, you might still find you don't have enough data, in which case, like, you get to the point where you're not overfitting by adding lots of weight decay and it's just not training very well. That can happen, right? But at least this is something that you can now play around with. Um, just to kind of go on here, um, now that we've got this update function, we could replace this MNIST logistic with MNIST neural network and build a neural network from scratch. Right? Now we just need two linear layers. Right? And the first one, we could use a weight matrix of size 50. And so we then need to make sure that the second linear layer has an input of size 50 so it matches. The final layer has to have an output of size 10 because that's the number of classes we're predicting. And so now our forward just goes to a linear layer, calculate ReLU, do a second linear layer, and now we've actually created a neural net from scratch. I mean, we didn't write it in linear, but you can write it yourself, or you could like do the matrices directly. You know how to. Um, so again, you know, if we go model dot CUDA, and then we can calculate losses with the exact same update function. There it goes, right? So this is why this kind of idea of neural nets is so easy, right? Once you have something that can do gradient descent. Right? then you can try different models. Um, and then you can start to add more PyTorch stuff. So like rather than add doing all this stuff yourself, why not just go opt equals optim dot something. So the something we've done so far is SGD. And so now you're saying to PyTorch, I want you to take these parameters and optimize them using SGD. And so this now, rather than saying for P in parameters, uh, P minus equals LR times P dot grad, you just say op dot step. It's the same thing. Okay, it's just less code, right? But, um, and it does the same thing. But the reason it's kind of particularly interesting is that now you can replace SGD with Atom, for example, and you can even add things like weight decay Right? Because like, there's more stuff that's kind of in these things for you, right? So that's why we tend to use, you know, optim.blah. So behind the scenes, this is actually what we do in FastAI. Um, so if I go optim.sgt, okay, so there's that, right? And so that's, that's just that picture. Um, but if we change to a different optimizer, ah, so look what happened. It diverged. Right? We've seen a great picture of that um, from one of our students who showed what divergence looks like 
um, this is what it looks like when you try to train something. So let's use, we're using a different optimizer, so we need a different learning rate. And you can't just continue training, because by the time it's diverged, the, the, the weights are like really, really big and really, really small. They're not going to come back. So start again. OK, there's a better learning rate. But look at this. We're down underneath 0.5 by about epoch 200, whereas before, I'm not even sure we ever got to quite that level. So what's going on? What's, what's Adam? Um, let me show you. And we're going to do gradient descent in Excel, because why wouldn't you? OK, so um, here is some randomly generated data, OK, some x's and some y's. Well, they're actually, they're randomly generated x's, and the y's are all calculated by doing ax plus b, where a is 2 and b is 30. OK, so this is some data that we're going to try and match. And here is SGD. Um, and so we're going to do it with SGD. Now, in our Lesson 2 SGD notebook, we did the whole data set at once as a batch. Um, in the notebook we just looked at, we did mini batches. In this spreadsheet, we're going to do um, online gradient descent, which means every single row of data is a batch. So it's kind of batch size of one. Okay. So uh, as per usual, we're going to start by picking an intercept and slope kind of arbitrarily. So I'm just going to pick them at one. doesn't really matter. Um, so here I've copied over the data. This is my x and y. And so my intercept and slope, as I said, is 1. Right? I'm just literally referring back to this cell here. So my prediction for this particular intercept and slope would be 14 times 1 plus 1, which is 15. And so there's my error, means uh, there's my sum of squares. Well, not, not even a sum at this point. It's the squared error. OK? So um, now I need to ca calculate the gradient so that I can update. There's two ways you can calculate the gradient. One is um, analytically, and so I, you, know, you can just look them up on Wolfram Alpha or whatever. So there's the gradients if you write it out by hand or look it up. Um, or you can do something called finite differencing, because remember, gradients just um, how far you move in, act, sorry, how far, you, how far the, the, the outcome moves divided by how far your change was for really small changes. So let's just make um, a really small change. Um, so here we've taken um, our intercept and added 0.01 to it, right? And then calculated our, um, our loss. And you can see that our, our loss went down a little bit, right? And we added 0.01 here, so our derivative is that difference divided by that 0.01. Okay? And that's called um, finite differencing. You can always do derivatives with finite differencing. It's slow. Um, we don't do it in practice, but it's nice for just checking stuff out. So we can do the same thing um, for our A term, add 0.01 to that, take the difference and divide by 0.01. Or as I say, we can calculate it directly using the actual derivative analytical. And you can see that you know that and that are, as you'd expect, very similar. And that and uh, that are very similar. So gradient descent then just says, let's take our um, current value of that weight and subtract the learning rate times the derivative. There it is. Right? And so now we can copy that intercept and that slope to the next row and do it again. And do it lots of times. And at the end, we've done one epoch. So at the end of that epoch, we could say, oh, great. So this is our slope. So let's copy that over to where it says slope. And this is our intercept. So we'll copy it to where it says intercept. And now it's done another epoch. OK? So um, that's kind of boring, um, copying and pasting. So um, I created a very sophisticated uh, macro, which copies and pastes uh, for you. And so um, I just recorded it, basically. And, so if, uh, and then I created a very sophisticated for loop that goes through and does it five times. Uh, and I attached that to the run button. So if I press run, it'll go ahead and do it five times and just keep track of the error each time. Okay, so that is 
STD. And as you can see, it is just infuriatingly slow. Like particularly the intercept is meant, to, sorry, yeah, is meant to be 30. And we're still only up to 1.57. And like, just, it's just going so slowly. So let's speed it up. So the first thing we can do to speed it up is to use something called momentum, right? So here's the uh, exact same um, spreadsheet as the last worksheet. Um, I've removed the finite differencing version of the derivatives uh, because they're not that useful, just the analytical ones here. And um, here's the thing where I take the, um, um, the derivative and um, uh, I'm going to uh, update by the derivative. Um, but what I do, it's kind of more interesting to look at this one, is I take the derivative and I multiply it by 0.1. And what I do is I look at the previous update and I multiply that by 0.9 and I add the two together. So in other words, the um, update that I do is not just based on the derivative, but a tenth of it is the derivative and 90% of it is just the same direction I went last time. And this is called momentum, right? What it means is, remember how um, we kind of thought about what might happen if you're trying to find the minimum of this and you were here and your learning rate was too small, right? And you just keep doing the same steps. Or if you keep doing the same steps, then if you also add in the step you took last time, then your steps are going to get bigger and bigger, aren't they? Okay, until eventually they go too far. But now, of course, your gradient's pointing the other direction to where your momentum's pointing. So you might just take a little step over here and then you'll start going small steps, bigger steps, bigger steps, small steps, bigger steps, like that. Right? So that's kind of what momentum does. Or if you're, um, if you're kind of going too far, like this, which is also slow, right? then the average of your last few steps is actually somewhere kind of between the two, isn't it? Right? So this is a really common idea, right? It's like when you have something that says kind of my, um, what is it in this case? It's like my step, my step at time t equals uh, some number. Um, people often use alpha because like I say, you've got to love these Greek letters. Um, some number um, times the actual thing I want to do, right? So it might, in this case, it's like the gradient, right? Plus one minus alpha times whatever you had last time, st minus one. This thing here is called um, an exponentially weighted moving average. And the reason why is that if you think about it, these one minus alphas are going to multiply. So st minus 2 is in here with a kind of a 1 minus alpha squared. And st minus 3 is in there with a 1 minus alpha cubed. So in other words, this ends up being um, the actual thing I want plus a weighted average of the last few time periods where the most recent ones are exponentially higher weighted. Okay? And this is going to keep popping up again and again. Right? So that's what momentum is. It says, I want to go based on the current gradient um, plus the exponentially weighted moving average of my last few steps. So that's useful. That's called uh, SGD with momentum. And we can do it by changing this here to saying SGD momentum. And momentum 0.9 is really common. It's, I don't know, it's like, it's so common, it's always 0.9, <laughs> just about, um, uh, for, for basic stuff. Uh, so that's how you do STD with momentum. Um, and, and again, it's not, I didn't show you some simplified version, I showed you the version, that is, that is SGD. Okay, that's, that's you, again, you can write your own, try it out. That would be a great assignment, would be to take lesson two SGD and add momentum to it. 
or even the, the, the new notebook we've got for MNIST, get rid of the optim dot and write your own update function with, with um, momentum. Then there's a cool thing called RMS prop. One of the really cool things about RMS prop is that um, Jeffrey Hinton um, uh, created it, uh, a famous neural net guy. Um, everybody uses it. It's like really popular. It's really common. Uh, the correct citation for RMS prop is the Coursera online free MOOC. Uh, that, that's where he first mentioned uh, RMS prop. So I, I love this thing that like, you know, cool new things appear in MOOCs, that not a paper. Um, so RMS prop is very similar to momentum, but this time we have an exponentially weighted moving average, not of the gradient updates, but of F8 squared. That's the gradient squared. So we've got the gradient squared times 0.1 plus the previous value times 0.9. So it's an exponentially, this is an exponentially weighted moving average of the gradient squared. So what's this number going to mean? Well, if my gradient's really small and consistently really small, this will be a small number. If my gradient is highly volatile, it's going to be a big number. Or if it's just really big all the time, it'll be a big number. And why is that interesting? Because when we do our update this time, we say, wait, minus learning rate times gradient divided by the square root of this. So in other words, if our gradient's consistently very small and not volatile, let's take bigger jumps. And that's kind of what we want, right? When we watched how the intercept moved so damn slowly, but it just, it's like, Obviously, you need to just try it, go faster. So if I now run this, after just five epochs, this is already up to three, right? Whereas with the basic version, after five epochs, it's still at 1.27. And remember, we have to get to 30. So the obvious thing to do, and by obvious, I mean only a couple of years ago did anybody actually figure this out, is do both. Right, so and that's called Adam. So Adam is simply keep track of the exponentially weighted moving average of the gradient squared, and also keep track of uh, the exponentially weighted moving average of my steps, right? And both divide by the um, exponentially weighted moving average of the squared terms, and uh, you know take 0.9 of a step in the same direction as last time. So it's, it's momentum and RMS prop. That's called Adam. And look at this. Okay, five steps, we're at 25. Okay, so, uh, you know, these, these, are, um, these optimizers, people call them dynamic learning rates. A lot of people have the misunderstanding that you don't have to set a learning rate. Of course you do, right? It's just like, trying to uh, identify parameters that need to move faster, you know, or are consistently going in the same direction. It doesn't mean you don't need learning rates. We still have a learning rate, okay? And in fact, you know, if I run this again, uh, currently my, um, my error, um, no, just do it again. So we're trying to get to 30 comma two. So if I run it again, it's getting better, but eventually, now it's just moving around the same place, right? So you can see what's happened is the learning rate's too high. So we could just go in here and drop it down and run it some more. Getting pretty close now, right? So you can see how you still need learning rate annealing, even with Adam. Okay, so that spreadsheet's fun to play around with. Um, I do have a Google Sheets version of basic SGD that actually works and the macros work and everything. Google Sheets is so awful and I went so insane making that work, I gave up on making the other ones work. So I'll share a link to the Google Sheets version. Um, 
Uh, oh my god. They do have a macro language, but it's just ridiculous. So anyway, if somebody feels like fighting it to actually get all the other ones to work, they will work. It's just, it's just annoying. Um, so maybe somebody can get this working on Google Sheets too. Okay, so that's weight decay um, and Adam. And Adam is amazingly fast. Um, and we, let's go back to this one. But we um, don't tend to use optim dot whatever and create the optimizer ourselves and all that stuff because instead we tend to use learner. But learner is just doing those things for you. Right, again, there's no magic, right? So if you create a learner, you say, here's my data bunch, here's my PyTorch nn.module instance, here's my loss function, and here are my metrics. Remember, the metrics are just stuff to print out. That's it, right? Then you just get a few nice things, like learn.lrfind starts working, and it starts recording this. And you can say fit one cycle instead of just fit. But like these things really help a lot. Like by using the learning rate finder, I found a good learning rate. And then like, look at this, my loss here, 0.13. Here I wasn't getting much beneath 0.5, right? So these, these tweaks uh, make huge differences, not tiny differences. Um, and this is still just one, one epoch. Um, now, what does fit one cycle do? What does it really do? This is what it really does. Right? And we've seen this chart on the left before. Just to remind you, this is plotting the learning rate per batch. Right? Remember, Adam has a learning rate. And we use Adam by default, or minor variation, which we might try to talk about. Um, so the learning rate starts really low, and it increases about half the time. And then it decreases about half the time. Because at the very start, we don't know where we are. Right, so we're in some part of function space that's just bumpy as all hell, right? So if you start jumping around, those bumps have big gradients and it'll throw you into crazy parts of the space, right? So start slow. And then you'll gradually move into parts of the weight space that, you know, they're kind of sensible. And as you get to the points where they're sensible, you can increase the learning rate, you know, because the, the gradients are, gen, uh, are, are actually in the direction you want to go. Right? And then, as we've discussed, a few times as you get close to the final answer, you need to anneal your learning rate to hone in on it. But here's the interesting thing. On the left is the momentum plot. And actually, every time our learning rate is small, our momentum is high. Why is that? Because if you do have a learning, small learning rate, but you keep going in the same direction, you may as well go faster. Right? But if you're jumping really far, don't like jump, jump really far because it's going to throw you off. Right? And then as you get to the end again, you're fine tuning in, but actually if you keep going in the same direction again and again, go faster. Right? So this combination is called one cycle and it's just this amazing, like it's a simple thing, but it's astonishing. Like this, um, can help you get what's called superconvergence that can let you train 10 times faster. And this is just last year's paper. And some of you may have seen the interview with Leslie Smith that I did last week. Um, amazing guy, incredibly humble. Um, and also, I should say, somebody who is doing groundbreaking research well into his 60s. Um, and all of these things are inspiring. I'll show you something else interesting. When you plot the losses with fast AI, it doesn't look like that. It looks like that. Why is that? Because fast AI calculates the exponentially weighted moving average of the losses for you. Right? So this, this concept of exponentially weighted stuff, it's just really handy. And uh, I use it all the time. And one of the things that is to make it easier to read these charts. Okay? It does mean that these charts uh, from fast AI might be kind of an epoch or two, sorry, a batch or two behind where they should be. Um, you know, there's that slight downside when you use an exponentially weighted moving average is you've got a little bit of history in there as well, but it can make it much easier to see what's going on. Um, so, we're now at a point 
coming to the end of this CoLab and Tabular section, where we're going to try to understand all of the code in our tabular model. So remember, the tabular model um, uses this data set called adult, which is trying to predict who's going to make more money. It's a classification problem. Um, and uh, we've got a number of categorical variables and a number of continuous variables. So the first thing we realize is we actually don't know how to predict a categorical variable yet because so far we did some hand waving around the fact that our loss function was nn.crossentropyloss. What is that? Let's find out. And of course, we're going to find out by looking at Microsoft Excel. So, um, Cross entropy loss is just another loss function. We already know one loss function, which is mean squared error. Y hat minus Y squared. Okay, so um, that's not a good loss function for us because in our case, we have, like for MNIST, 10 possible digits and our, we have 10 activations, each with a probability of that digit. Okay. Um, so we need something where predicting the right thing correctly and confidently should have very little loss. Predicting the wrong thing confidently should have a lot of loss. So that's what we want. Okay, so here's an example. Here is a cat versus dog, one hot encoded. Okay. And here are my two activations for each one from some model that I built. Probability cat, probability dog. This one's not very confident of anything. This one's very confident of it being a cat and it's right. This one's very confident of being a cat and it's wrong. So we want a loss that for this one should be a moderate loss because not predicting anything confidently is not really what we want. So here's a point three. This thing's predicting the correct thing very confidently, so 0.01. This thing's predicting the wrong thing very confidently, so one. So how do we do that? This is the cross entropy loss. And it is equal to um, whether it's a cat multiplied by log of the probability of cat. Well, this is actually an activation, so I should say. So it's multiplied by the log of the cat activation. Uh, negative that minus is it a dog times the log of the dog activation. And that's it. Okay, so in other words, it's the sum of all of your one hot encoded variables times all of your um, activations. So interestingly, these ones here are exactly the same numbers as these ones here, but I've written it differently. I've written it with an if function because it's exactly the, because the zeros don't actually add anything, right? So actually it's exactly the same as saying if it's a cat, then take the log of cattiness, and if it's a dog, yeah, so otherwise, take the log of one minus cattiness, in other words, the log of dogginess. So the um, sum of the one hot encoded times the activations is the same as an if function, which if you think about it, it's actually, because this is just a matrix multiply, this is, we now know from our, from our um, embedding discussion, that's the same as an index lookup. So you can also, to do cross entropy, you can also just look up the log of the activation for the correct answer. Now that's only going to work if these rows add up to one. And this is one reason that you can get screwy cross entropy numbers is, that's why I said you press the wrong button. If they don't add up to one, you've got a trouble. So how do you make sure that they add up to one? You make sure they add up to one by using the correct activation function in your last layer. And the correct activation function to use for this is softmax. Softmax is an activation function where all of the activations add up to one. All of the activations are greater than zero and all of the activations are less than one. So that's what we want, right? That's what we need. How do you do that? Well, let's say we were predicting one of five things, cat, dog, plane, fish, building. And these were the numbers that came out of our neural net for one set of predictions. 
Well, what if I did e to the power of that? So that's one step in the right direction, because e to the power of something is always bigger than zero. So there's a bunch of numbers that are always bigger than zero. Here's the sum of those numbers. Here is e to the number divided by the sum of e to the number. Now this number is always less than one, right? Because all of the things were positive, so you can't possibly have one of the pieces be bigger than 100% of its sum, okay? And all of those things must add up to one, right? Because each one of them was just that percentage of the total. So that's it. So this thing, softmax, is equal to e to the activation divided by the sum of e to the activations. And that's called softmax. And so when we're doing single label, multi-class classification, you generally want softmax as your activation function, and you generally want cross entropy as your loss. And because these things go together in such friendly ways, um, PyTorch will do them both for you. Right? So you might have noticed that in this MNIST example, I never added a softmax here. And that's because if you ask for cross entropy loss, it actually does the softmax in, inside the loss function. So it's not really just cross entropy loss, it's actually softmax then cross entropy loss. So you've probably noticed this, but sometimes your predictions from your models will come out looking more like this, pretty big numbers with negatives in, rather than this, numbers between naught and one that add up to one. The reason would be that PyTorch, it's a PyTorch model that doesn't have a softmax in because we're using cross entropy loss, and so you might have to do the softmax for it. Um, fast AI is getting increasingly good at knowing when this is happening, generally if you're using a loss function that we recognize, when you get the predictions, we will try to add the softmax in there for you. But if you, particularly if you're using a custom loss function that you know might call an end dot cross entropy loss behind the scenes or something like that, you might find yourself with this situation. We only have three minutes left, but I'm gonna point something out to you, which is that next week, when we finish off tabula, which we'll do in like the first 10 minutes, this is forward in tabula. And it basically goes through a bunch of embeddings, right? It's gonna call each one of those embeddings E, and you can use it like a function, of course. So it's gonna pass in each categorical variable to each embedding. It's gonna concatenate them together into a single matrix. Um, it's going to then call a bunch of layers, which are basically a bunch of linear layers. And then it's going to do our sigmoid trick. And then there's only two new things we need to learn. One is dropout. And the other is the nCont batch norm. And these are two additional regularization strategies. Right? They're basically um, batch norm does more than just regularization, but amongst other things it does regularization. And the basic ways you regularize your model are um, weight decay, batch norm, and dropout. Okay, um, and then you can also avoid overfitting using something called data augmentation. So batch norm and dropout we're going to touch on at the start of next week, um, and we're also going to look at data augmentation, and then we're also going to look at what convolutions are, and we're going to learn some new uh, computer vision uh, architectures and some new computer vision um, um, applications. Uh, but basically, we're very nearly there. You already know how the entirety of uh, um, uh, collab.py, fastai.collab, works. Um, you know why it's, why it's there and what it does, and you're very close to knowing um, what the entirety of um, uh, tabular model does. And this tabular model uh, is actually the one that if you run it on Rossman, you'll get the same answer that I showed you in that paper. You'll get that second place result. In fact, even a little bit better, um, 
Um, I'll show you next week if I remember how I actually ran some additional experiments where I um, figured out some minor tweaks that can do even slightly better than that. Um, so yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks very much and enjoy the smoke outside. <laughs>